Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. The family of Dashwood had long been settled in Sussex. Their estate was large and their residence was at Norland Park. The late owner of this estate was a single man who lived to a very advanced age and who for many years of his life had a constant companion and housekeeper in his sister. But her death produced a great alteration in his home. For to supply her loss, he invited and received into his house the family of his nephew, Mr. Henry Dashwood, the legal inheritor of the Norland estate. By a former marriage, Mr. Henry Dashwood had one son, John, by his present lady, three daughters, Eleanor, Marianne, and Margaret. The old gentleman died, his will was read, and like almost every other will, gave as much disappointment as pleasure. The whole was tied up for the benefit of the son's child. Mr. John Dashwood was not an ill-disposed young man, unless to be rather cold-hearted and rather selfish is to be ill-disposed. Had he married a more amiable woman, he might even have been amiable himself. But Mrs. John Dashwood was a strong caricature of himself more narrow-minded and selfish. No sooner was his father's funeral over than Mrs. John Dashwood, without sending any notice of her intention to her mother-in-law, arrived with her child and their attendants. So acutely did Mrs. Dashwood feel this ungracious behaviour, she would have quitted the house for ever had not the entreaty of her eldest girl induced her first to reflect on the propriety of going. Eleanor, this eldest daughter, whose advice was so effectual, possessed a strength of understanding and coolness of judgment which qualified her, though only nineteen, to be the counsellor of her mother. She had an excellent heart, her disposition was affectionate, and her feelings were strong, but she knew how to govern them. It was a knowledge which her mother had yet to learn, and which one of her sisters had resolved never to be taught. Marianne's abilities were, in many respects, quite equal to Eleanor's. She was sensible and clever, but eager in everything. Her sorrows, her joys, could have no moderation. She was generous, amiable, interesting. She was everything but prudent. The resemblance between her and her mother was strikingly great. Margaret, the other sister, was a good-humoured, well-disposed girl. She did not at thirteen bid fair to equal her sisters at a more advanced period of her life. Mrs. John Dashwood now installed herself mistress of Norland, and her mother and sisters-in-law were degraded to the condition of visitors. She did not at all approve of what her husband intended to do for his sisters. To take three thousand pounds from the fortune of their dear little boy would be impoverishing him to the most dreadful degree. She begged him to think again on the subject. It was my father's last request to me, replied her husband, that I should assist his widow and daughters. If I were you, whatever I did should be done at my own discretion entirely. Your father thought only of them. You owe no particular gratitude to him, nor attention to his wishes. This argument was irresistible, and John Dashwood finally resolved that it would be absolutely unnecessary, if not highly indecorous, to do more for the widow and children of his father than such kind of neighbourly acts as his own wife pointed out. Mrs. Dashwood remained in Norland for several months. When her spirits began to revive, she was impatient to be gone and indefatigable in her inquiries for a suitable dwelling in the neighbourhood of Norland. The contempt which she had very early in their acquaintance felt for her daughter-in-law was very much increased by the farther knowledge of her character. The two ladies might have found it impossible to have lived together for so long had not a particular circumstance occurred to give them still greater eligibility, according to the opinions of Mrs. Dashwood, to her daughter's continuance at Norland. This circumstance was a growing attachment between her eldest girl and the brother of Mrs. John Dashwood. 
Edward Ferrers was the eldest son of a man who had died very rich, and some might have repressed it from motives of prudence, for, except a trifling sum, the whole of his fortune depended on the will of his mother. Edward Ferrers was not recommended to their good opinion by any peculiar graces of person or address. He was not handsome, and his manners required intimacy to make them pleasing. He was too diffident to do justice to himself, but when his natural shyness was overcome, his behaviour gave every indication of an open, affectionate heart. His understanding was good, and his education had given it solid improvement. Mrs. Dashwood now took pains to get acquainted with him. No sooner did she perceive any symptom of love in his behaviour to Eleanor than she considered their serious attachment as certain and looked forward to their marriage as rapidly approaching. Marianne, do you disapprove your sister's choice? Perhaps, said Marianne. I may consider it with some surprise. Edward is very amiable and I love him tenderly, but I am afraid, Mamma, he has no real taste. Eleanor was far from depending on his preference of her, which her mother and sister still considered as certain. But, whatever might really be its limits, it was enough, when perceived by Mrs. John Dashwood, to make her uneasy, and at the same time to make her uncivil. She took the first opportunity of affronting her mother-in-law. Mrs. Dashwood resolved that, whatever might be the inconvenience or expense of so sudden a removal, her beloved Eleanor should not be exposed another week to such insinuations. In this state of her spirits, a letter was delivered to her, which contained a proposal particularly well-timed. It was the offer of a small house, on very easy terms, belonging to a relation of her own, a gentleman of consequence and property in Devonshire. She instantly wrote Sir John Middleton her acknowledgement of his kindness and her acceptance of his proposal. No sooner was her answer dispatched than Mrs. Dashwood indulged herself in the pleasure of announcing to her son-in-law and his wife that she was provided with a house. She took the house for a twelvemonth. It was ready furnished and she might have immediate possession. In a very few weeks, everything was so far settled in their future abode as to enable Mrs. Dashwood and her daughters to begin their journey. As a house, Barton Cottage, though small, was comfortable and compact. In comparison of Norland, it was poor and small indeed, but the tears which recollection called forth as they entered the house were soon dried away. Each of them was busy in arranging their particular concerns, and in such employments as these they were interrupted soon after breakfast the next day by the entrance of their landlord. Sir John Middleton was a good-looking man about forty. His countenance was thoroughly good-humoured, and his manners were as friendly as the style of his letter. He pressed them so cordially to dine at Barton Park every day till they were better settled at home that they could not give offence. Lady Middleton had sent a very civil message by him, denoting her intention of waiting on Mrs. Dashwood as soon as she could be assured that her visit would be no inconvenience, and as this message was answered by an invitation equally polite, her ladyship was introduced to them the next day. Lady Middleton was not more than six or seven and twenty. Her face was handsome, her figure tall and striking, and her address graceful. Her manners had all the elegance which her husband's wanted, but... She was reserved, cold, and had nothing to say for herself beyond the most commonplace inquiry or remark. Barton Park was about half a mile from the cottage. The house was large and handsome, and the Middletons lived in a style of equal hospitality and elegance. The former was for Sir John's gratification, the latter for that of his lady. Sir John was a sportsman, Lady Middleton a mother. He hunted, and she humoured her children. Mrs. Dashwood and her daughters were met at the door of the house by Sir John, who welcomed them to Barton Park with unaffected sincerity. They would see, he said, only one gentleman there besides himself, a particular friend who was staying at the park, but who was neither very young nor very gay. Luckily, Lady Middleton's mother had arrived at Barton within the last hour, and as she was a very cheerful, agreeable woman, he hoped the young ladies would not find it so very dull as they might imagine. Mrs. Jennings, Lady Middleton's mother, was a good-humoured, merry, fat, elderly woman who talked a great deal, seemed very happy and rather vulgar. Colonel Brandon, the friend of Sir John, was silent and grave. 
In the evening, as Marianne was discovered to be musical, she was invited to play. Her performance was highly applauded. Colonel Brandon alone, of all the party, heard her without being in raptures. He paid her only the compliment of attention. The whole country about them abounded in beautiful walks. Towards one of these hills did Marianne and Margaret, one memorable morning, direct their steps. Suddenly, the clouds united over their heads, and a driving rain set full in their face. They were obliged to turn back. They set off. Marianne had at first the advantage, but a false step brought her suddenly to the ground, and Margaret, unable to stop herself to assist her, was involuntarily hurried along and reached the bottom in safety. A gentleman carrying a gun, with two pointers playing around him, was passing up the hill when Marianne's accident happened. The gentleman offered his services. Perceiving that her modesty declined what her situation rendered necessary, he took her up in his arms without further delay and carried her down the hill. He bore her directly into the house, whither Margaret was just arrived, and quitted not his hold till he had seated her in a chair in the parlour. Eleanor and her mother rose up in amazement at their entrance. Mrs. Dashwood thanked him again and again, and begged to know to whom she was obliged. His name, he replied, was Willoughby, and his present home was at Allenham, the home of his cousin, Mrs. Smith, from whence he hoped she would allow him the honour of calling tomorrow to inquire after Miss Dashwood. The honour was readily granted, and then he departed. His manly beauty and more than common gracefulness were instantly the theme of general admiration, and Marianne had seen enough of him to join in all the admiration of the others. Sir John called on them as soon as the next interval of fair weather that morning allowed him to get out of doors, and Marianne's accident being related to him, he was eagerly asked whether he knew any gentleman of the name of Willoughby at Allenham. Know him? To be sure I do. And what sort of young man is he? Sir John was rather puzzled. He is a pleasant, good-humoured fellow. But who is he? said Eleanor. On this point, Sir John could give more certain intelligence. Marianne's preserver, as Margaret with more elegance than precision styled Willoughby, called at the cottage early the next morning to make his personal inquiries. Eleanor Dashwood had a delicate complexion, regular features, and a remarkably pretty figure. Marianne was still handsomer. It was only necessary to mention any favourite amusement to engage her to talk. They speedily discovered that their enjoyment of dancing and music was mutual, she proceeded to question him on the subject of books. Their taste was strikingly alike. Well, Marianne, said Eleanor, as soon as he had left them, for one morning I think you have done pretty well. You will soon have exhausted every favourite topic. Eleanor, cried Marianne, is this fair? Are my ideas so scanty? My love, said her mother, you must not be offended with Eleanor. She was only in jest. Willoughby came to them every day. He was exactly formed to engage Marianne's heart, for he joined a captivating person with a natural ardour of mind. They read, they talked, they sang together, but he displayed a want of caution of which Eleanor could not approve. Colonel Brandon's partiality for Marianne, which had so early been discovered by his friends, now first became perceptible to Eleanor when it ceased to be noticed by them. She saw it with concern, for what could a silent man of five-and-thirty hope when opposed by a very lively one of five-and-twenty?